Hey YouTube, I'm Ali, welcome to the channel. Now, the ancient Chinese game of Go has been around for thousands of years and has been enjoyed and is still enjoyed by millions of people. But for one avid fan, there were two key elements that weren't quite right. Today, I get to speak with Steve Wilmot and understand his journey from classic Chinese board game to Kickstarter success. Now, just before we start, a quick word on quality. Um, Steve and I spoke through Zoom on a pretty poor internet connection, unfortunately. There are a couple of times where he drops out. I've done my best to fix that through the editing process, and hopefully it shouldn't mar the presentation at all. I want you to bear with because the information, as always, is gold. Hopefully, this video will still inform, entertain, and most importantly, inspire. So I'm kind of an accidental game designer, if you like. Um, basically, my background is IT, so I build big software systems and, and various things like that. Um, and uh, way back, I did a mathematics degree and then got into AI and a bunch of things. So I'm a completely different world from game design. And um, I uh, ended up with a bunch of friends um, building a game that's now just finished its Kickstarter campaign and got funded. It's called Mit Metropia. And uh, the game is based on the ancient game of Go in various ways, but we've done a lot of things to it. And um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of a, an interesting journey that we've been on with that. So I got involved with Go way back, so in about 96, 97, shows how old I am. Um, and uh, I was doing a master's in AI at the time, and uh, I actually built a Go playing system. So it was one of the smarter Go, Go playing systems at the time. And Go just turned into this really fascinating thing. It's a, it's a very simple rules, very simple rules, um, but a very deep strategy underneath it. I mean, all that is very well, but what exactly was wrong with Go then? One of the frustrations with Go that I had was that it was only a two-player game. And that's nice, it's great to play against one other person, but sometimes you want to get, have a tame game on the table where more people can play and you can kind of have more of a a group feel to it, sort of four or five players, maybe even six players, something like that. The idea of having a multiplayer version of Go kind of got into my brain. And that was that was the, the thing that kind of really clicked. And then the next thing was that Go is kind of intimidating, right? You look at it and it's very abstract and it's hard to sort of get your head around. And when you're the first time player, you really don't know what's going on, right? You, you might understand the rules, but you have no idea what to actually do. So the idea was, well, can, can it be made more accessible? Like how, do, how do we make it more accessible to have it really as a fun tabletop game with more than more than two people. And so that kind of just appeared, I don't know, even I just woke up one day thinking, wow, that would be kind of cool, wouldn't it? <laughs> right? Um, and that was that was already, you know, seven, eight years ago now. And uh, but that was kind of the genesis of the uh, of the what's next for go for me. Making a game multiplayer and more accessible, I don't think you can fault those as starting points for trying to build a game. But really, did it take seven to eight years? No, so so on the one hand, these, these timescales are going to sound scary. But on the other hand, I hope that it gives people a bit of optimism that if you have an idea that it can eventually come to fruition. So so how long did it take Steve to go from initial concept and idea of wanting to change Go into something that you could actually hold and play with? Well, it was just a stupid idea, right? It's just a stupid idea. So what do you do about it? You sit in it for a while. And then at some point I thought, well, it's worth trying. So the first iterations were just among friends. We just sort of, what can we do here? So we got these giant sheets of paper, drew grids all over them, uh, put holes in the middle of the grids because I thought that would be fun. And then we got magic marker type things and drained the ink out of them and dyed some ghost stones, different colors. We even had gold and silver pieces. And uh, the first game, I think, didn't get finished. <laughs> so it was a pretty crazy, uh, uh, crazy, crazy thing. Um, but that's sort of started it, and it was it was slow. And just once every couple of months, we play something and do a new iteration and noodle around with it. And it got smaller, it got neater, it got more organised, and so on. And uh, so we didn't really have to face the oh you're defacing Go problem because most of the people I was playing with were not actually Go players at the time. One thing that became very apparent to me as I spoke with Steve was that rather than rushing through. Uh, a process to get a game out, Steve was taking a much more considered and deliberate approach. Uh, and that really did come as a little bit of a surprise to me. What didn't come as a surprise though, given his previous answer, 
was the answer to the question, how long did it take to go from a prototype, a rough prototype, to something he could take out and get tested amongst strangers? Um, I'd say it took about four or five years, <laughs> which now I talk about, it sounds horrendously long. But it was sort of evolving the whole point, whole way. And I think there, there, were, there was a really interesting turning point in the middle where my original idea was to make multiplayer go. And, and there had been attempts at multiplayer go before, but they hadn't been very successful. And as you said, it's been done for chess and so on. And sometimes those things land well, and sometimes people dislike them intensely and so on. Um, and one of the kind of really key points was there was a big discussion um, amongst some of us who were working on the game about, well, are we really trying to multiplayer or were you trying to make a game that is based on the mechanics of Go? And that sounds like a very similar thing, um, but they're actually very different. So the move to this idea of, actually we're making a game that uses the Go mechanic as an underlying component, a very important one, was really liberating because we kind of hit this um, buffer where um, we didn't want to mess with certain mechanics of Go because that would break some of the dynamics the game gets from it. But on the other side, um, it was sort of limiting what we could do. So that's when we added a theme and we did all sorts of things. So things went very quickly from there. That was about two and a half years ago, I'd say something like that. Now, one of the great benefits in taking that extra amount of time in the development stage was that Steve and his friends could reshape and reevaluate his initial idea and from it derive a theme, a realization of a completely new set of game mechanics because of that theme. And well, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me rewind a little bit. Let's talk about the theme that Steve came up with. Yeah, it's, it's basically Bronze Age. It's, it's Bronze Age. So we went and looked at what tribes were around the world at that, in that age. So we expanded a bit and we went from the Mediterranean basis to basin to a few other places. I mean, it could have been any, any kind of um, martial setting in some sense. I think with Go, it's a bit hard to get away from the fact that what you're doing is you're sort of fighting a war. I mean, that's really what Go is. It's a strategic war game in some way, a very abstract one. Um, and so we softened that a bit by saying, you know, it's a, it's a, comp it's a comp competition rather than a war. But still, the idea of tribes kind of came out of the idea that we had alliances between different players would often form on the board. If you've got five players, the game dynamics give you a lot, but often it's quite a fun to, you end up ganging up a bit on someone, but if you do that, then you leave yourself open to attack from somebody else. So there's lots of back and forth. And the idea that you're different tribes actually kind of gained a lot of um, credence when we started adding special powers to each tribe. So each tribe would be able to do slightly different things and make the game slightly asymmetric. Um, which steps away from Go, you wouldn't do that in Go, but it turned out to be really interesting and people would have their favorite tribes. So having decided upon a theme and created some game mechanics to flow from that theme, what other challenges did Steve have? We were trying to create a certain experience. So if you remember, there were two premises, right? One of them was make, make it multiplayer and the other one was make it accessible. Well, they're hard <laughs> to do. And making something accessible is tricky. Um, and so we wanted to introduce some randomness into the game, but not too much. If it's too random, then it gets tricky. So probably the biggest problem we had is we added various mechanics. For example, we have these cards. So rather than just playing one move, you can sometimes play two. Uh, you can sometimes play two pieces together. You can sometimes deflect a move and force the player to move somewhere else. So balancing the power of those kinds of additions to the actual core game was really what became the trickiest thing. And there'd be times where we'd be looking to, to have a certain effect and our first guess would be wildly wrong. And it would just destroy the game effectively because someone could use the rule in unexpected ways. Now, if you subscribe to the channel, and if you haven't, please do so because uh, every sub helps me. Then if you subscribe to the channel, then you'll know the best way of overcoming such challenges is to play test. I asked Steve what his approach was to playtesting and whether he found it a difficult task to find the right people to test his product. It is definitely hard to do, right? It's, it's one of the hardest things to find, um, so, you know, get, to get feedback on the game, to playtest it. Um, we were lucky in the sense that we had a whole bunch of friends that were really into board games and that would play. The problem with those with those friends, they're often too nice to you, right? So they won't tell you that something is really terrible or something's a terrible idea. 
So you probably have to bribe them somehow to, well, you know, you have to try to really push them to give you that feedback. There, there were some board game clubs around where we were there. Some specifically have game design nights, so you can try going there. It's quite intimidating walking into a room full of board game designers and then showing them your stuff. Um, but that's actually still very, very effective. Um, you get you get good feedback, some, sometimes overly precise feedback, solutions rather than problems kind of feedback. Um, but um, the other things that really worked well for us, so one was when we started getting to the point where we had some prototypes, um, just putting that on Facebook. It's amazing how many people come out of the woodwork and go, oh, actually, I like board games as well. Um, and so that would create an opportunity to, to have them tested as well. So, so that really helped. Another thing that happened was we used Tabletopia to do testing because at some point we moved apart. So our team couldn't really work on the game anymore. So we created the virtual version. And that, again, allowed us to share it with more friends. Last one, which is probably the craziest, well, we were craziest, but um, it can be hard to pull off. But we actually went to um, big conventions like Gen Con and Essen. And um, you can do this quite cheaply. Um, there are often board game testing uh, sub events within things like Gen Con that you can sit down and people will just show up and test the game and give you feedback. And that was incredibly helpful because this is really random people that don't know you at all. And they'll give you sort of a much more unbiased view of what your game is like. Testing, of course, is an important part of the design process. But sometimes we forget how important it is to have other people review our work. Uh, one of the things that Steve benefited from was an input of extra ideas that he was able to then think through and perhaps consider as expansions later. Um, as we play tested, we realized um, there were a lot of um, additional overlay game rules that we could we could talk about. I think one of your previous guests I watched one of the podcasts was talking about modular approaches. So it definitely was a little bit like that. There are, there are rule sets that we could add to the game that make it, uh, that add new dimensions to the game. And those rule sets, we tested them heavily and we were quite happy with them. But if we'd put them all in the first game, I think it would have been overwhelming for people. And so there's quite a lot of potential for having those as expansions in the future. Now, being a pushy so-and-so, I'm afraid I took a little advantage of Steve's good nature here and tried to pry a little bit more information around what those expansions could look like. So you put down hexagons to make the board together, so that gives you a sort of a naturally six-sided environment. Well, there are five tribes in the game at the moment, so you can imagine what one of the expansions could be. For the rest of the interview, Steve and I spoke about Kickstarter, some of the pitfalls and challenges that he encountered, and the benefits and his thoughts about the whole process. I think his thoughts, as well as some of the thoughts I gathered from previous interviews, probably deserve a completely separate conversation uh, and a separate video. So look out for that in the future. For now, though, I began to close down the interview. And of course, I asked my cliche question. If you had one piece of advice to give a budding game designer, what would it be? The obvious one is don't give up. but. Um... I'd say just to make it a bit, make something more specific. If you are taking a classic game, um, think about whether you're modifying a classic game or whether you're using mechanics that you love from a classic game to make a different game. And you, both of those are very, very valid. They both work. Um, but think about the mechanics and the experience you're trying to create. There are certain things we wanted to make sure that we retained from Go that were really critical. We, we were very religious about keeping them. And there are certain things that we just said, we don't, we don't worry about that so much anymore, right? We're not that concerned about it. We're, we're trying to create an effect. And it's the effect with the player that you really want to create. So when people's faces light up and go, ha, huh, I just nailed my, my opponent here and, and did something that they didn't expect. Once again, I want to say thank you to Steve for taking time out to speak with me. Uh, we actually had a full start and he was incredibly patient and generous with his time to have a second interview. So I really appreciate that. Um, Mytropia is still available on Kickstarter through a late pledge. Uh, I'm gonna put a link below in my description. If you've not had a chance to pledge, uh, I urge you to do so and grab a copy while you can. Um, for now though, as always, I want you guys to look after yourselves, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done, give this video a thumbs up and a like if you can, and until next time, take care YouTube.